Thank you. Last talk of the day. We can do this. Let's go. Um, hi, my name is Igor. I'm a founding engineer at Rockset, and the title of my talk today is How We Isolate Streaming Ingest from uh, Search Using a RocksDB. By the way, this is quite a technical talk, so if at any point you have questions, totally feel free to raise your hand and ask. You know, we are a small crowd, so we can, we can go through that way, so we can kind of interact more um, through the talk. And then I think we'll have time for questions at the end as well. If you don't want to interrupt, it's fine. So the, the system we will design today looks like this. The, this question mark box is the system we, we are trying to design. Um, the system receives um, updates from a stream. This could be either document insertions or document mutations. Uh, the system should, should store the data and provide the SQL interface on top of the data, where the SQL queries that are coming in could be either search queries. Uh, so that means we'll probably want to build some sort of inverted index on top of our data. They could be vector search queries, so we'll need some sort of approximate nearest neighbor index. And they could also be um, real-time analytics kind of queries with a lot of joins and so on. Uh, the consumer of our systems are application, which puts some sort of constraining, uh, constraints on our design. Namely, if it's an application, you want to make sure your query latency are very low. And at the same time, you also need to support very high QPS. Um, of, of, of the queries, or in other words, a high number of concurrent queries at the same time. And um, there's one more constraint, which is we want to make this system real-time. That means that the time from when the document enters our system and the time when it uh, is reflected in the queries, we call this ingest latency, is very low. Uh, the budget we have is a sub-second. So it takes one second for the, query to, uh, for the document to come into our pipeline, and be reflected in the queries in the application. Um, the reason we want, to support, we want one system to support multiple kind of queries is that in practice what we see is there are always queries that you know, can benefit from two or three of those indexes that we build. So sometimes you have a search query that needs to do some joins, so you can benefit from analytical indexes that we build. Uh, there's all, there's new, new talk of vector search that uh, graduates into hybrid search, so you want search index and the vector index at the same time. And there are also queries that could use all three of those kind of uh, accelerators. So this is the system we are trying to build. Uh, you know, it's not, not a surprise this is Roxa, this is the, the system we built. But I'll try to talk about it more from the generic point of view. So. Uh, the lessons that we learned and the architecture pressures that we, um, that we put the system under should apply to other system builders as well, especially people building stateful systems uh, in the cloud. So Rockset is a search and analytics SQL database, now also vector uh, SQL database. It's real-time, so our ingest latency budget is a sub-second. Um, it's cloud-native, which means we were built for the cloud and we are trying to take a maximum advantage of that fact that we are built for the cloud and optimized for the cloud. And then finally, Rockset is optimized for applications. So we support very high rate of queries per second. Um, and also, we try to make all the queries be extremely low latency. Tens or hundreds of milliseconds is what we aim for. Uh, Rockset is based on RocksDB. How many of you have heard of RocksDB before? Almost everybody. Wow, OK. I guess that's why you're here. Um, RocksDB is a key value store based on log structure merge trees. It was uh, open sourced by Facebook in 2013. In fact, just last year, we celebrated 10th anniversary of open sourcing. And the last decade, it has seen wide adoption across the industry for various kinds of use cases um, related to data. <clears throat> so the first part of my talk, I will explore what is this cloud native design. How do we build a stateful system that takes full advantage of the fact that it runs in the cloud? So we'll start with that previous diagram we had, the system diagram. And now instead of the question mark, we have the Rockset logo in there. Uh, so the first decision we have to make in the system design is that we want to support data that doesn't fit in a single machine, in a single box. So we'll need more than one box. And if you have more than one box, you need to do sharding. Somehow you need to map the data partitions onto nodes, so you need to choose a sharding scheme. And there's a lot, big body of research of how you choose sharding schemes but it boils down to a couple of uh, questions, a couple of decisions you have to make. The first question is, can your documents change? In other words, are they mutable or are they immutable? And there are some systems out there, they say, you know, it's easier to build systems with documents that are immutable, so they can never change. 
which makes, you know, it's, it's easier to build such a system, so we'll just do that. But obviously that makes it much harder for the users of the system to use the system if your documents cannot change, but they do change in the real world, so how do you actually paper over that fact? So in our case, we decided most use cases do not support um, immutable documents, so in, in the case of our system that we're building, the documents are fully mutable, they can change in whatever way you want them to change. Okay, so now after that decision, um, we have to choose the sharding, the shard that the particular document lives on, and we can choose the shard based on the value of a field in a document, right? So sometimes the systems call this clustering key, sharding key, partitioning key, distribution key. So you have a key in a document that um, based on that key you choose where the shard, where the document is going to live. Um, the, bet, the good part about that is when you have a predicate on that uh, clustering key, your query can only talk to one single shard and then all the data that it cares about lives close to each other, so your read IOs are much bigger than there would be um, in, in the, in the other, other, other system. But the problem is if your documents are mutable, which means they can change, that means the clustering key can change as well. So if your clustering key changes, that means one shard has to talk to another shard and say, hey, I have a document that I need to donate because now it's your document, not my document anymore, and that is coordination. The way systems usually solve this coordination problem and overhead of coordination is by increasing ingest latency and saying, my ingest latency is 30 minutes. And during that 30 minutes, because my batch size is bigger, I can, I can lower my coordination overhead because I do coordinate once per batch, which is a 30 minute batch. But as I said in the beginning, we are trying to achieve a system that has a very low ingest latency um, of sub-second. And if you, you know, do the math, uh, the, the overhead of coordination of the documents being exchanged between shards gets too big. So at the end, the sharding scheme we picked is so-called so doc sharding. Doc sharding is um, a name out of the search community world, so uh, many of you are probably familiar with this. And the downside of doc sharding is your read IOs are smaller. Every query needs to uh, go to every single shard because you just basically distribute documents on shards more or less randomly. But if you solve the problem of small read IOs, you get a lot of downstream benefits. So first downstream benefit you get, your ingest is very efficient. Because you think about it, for a particular shard, everything that happens for that ingest for that shard is there on that shard itself. There's no cross-shard communication whatsoever. And then the other benefit is we also group indexes on the same shard where the data lives, and we keep them consistent because we use RocksDB's feature of atomic cross-shard writes. So that way, we, in the same shard, which is a RocksDB instance, we can we can have indexes that are, that are uh, consistent uh, with the data itself. So just to illustrate the IO point again, so the clustering, um, if you have a query which has a, and usually does have a predicate on the clustering key, you go to a single shard, you read the data from that shard in one big IO operation. In the doc sharding, you, your query has to go to all the shards, you're not actually reading more or less data, you're reading the same amount of data from, from your storage device, um, but your data set, your number of read IOs are, are, are bigger, and obviously your read IO, each read IO is smaller. So that's a problem we'll have to solve later. Okay, so now we pick doc sharding. Doc sharding gives us scalability because sharding, we can use multiple machines, we can use multiple documents, uh, and multiple com uh, nodes, and then it also gives us very efficient streaming ingest because there's no cross-shard communication uh, during ingestion time. The next, and this is the title of my, in the title of my talk, is we don't want the same machine, so let's call machines virtual instances because this is how we call them and it's gonna be easier to, um, to, to it's not, because they're not technically machines, they're, you know, they're clusters of machines, so we call them virtual instances. So what we want is we don't want one virtual instance to pay the cost of ingest and query at the same time. Because then what can happen is if you have a spike in ingest load, it could regress your query performance. And the same goes in the other way. If you have a spike in query load, it can regress your ingest performance, which usually turns into higher end-to-end -end latency. So you're no longer real-time if you do that. So what we want is we want to have two different virtual instances, one that is responsible for ingest and another one that is responsible for queries. And here you can see that ingest happens in the orange color. And so we want most of the compute on the ingest workers to be spent on ingest. And then on the right-hand side, you see green color, it's query compute. And so we want most of the query compute, most of the compute on the query worker, on the query virtual instance, to be spent on ingest, and almost none of the compute 
or very little compute to be spent on, on, on ingest side, while still maintaining the one second end-to-end -end latency. So query will still need to query worker will still need to do some work, but we want to make sure that work is as cheap as possible. And we'll go into details of how exactly we uh, we do that. But now that we have isolation between ingest and query, the next thing we can do is we can have multiple query workers or multiple query virtual instances. So in this case, we can have, um, if you have two applications, we don't want an increase in load in one application to take down all the applications we have. So we want to have some sort of isolation. So if your application suffers a spike in load, it doesn't affect either ad other applications, and it also doesn't affect uh, the ingest, which is nice. Um, and then if you do have a spike in load, we also want to make sure that you have uh, auto-scaling. So if, let's say, application A becomes popular, yeah, that's great, but what you need to do is you, your database needs to grow in size, so you have to get more machines or you have to get bigger machines to, suffer, to, to, to handle that spike in workload. The problem uh, that, that happens in this system that we still need to solve is that, as you can see, that every single virtual instance we allocate needs to pay also for the copy of the, of the storage, right? because we have storage associated with our compute nodes. And that's a problem because obviously if you pay for more storage, that's more expensive. But also if you have this um, auto-scaling mechanism where application A becomes mo more popular, now you need to get more machines from, let's say, AWS or your cloud provider. But before that machine is useful, you, it, you have to load some storage onto it. And loading storage takes tens of minutes. So the last thing you want when you have this spike in load to, for your you know, database provider to tell you, We'll, we'll give you more machines, but gives us, give us tens of minutes before we are able to do so. So the solution for both of those problems, for both the storage costs that, that are increased with every single application, and also for um, auto-scaling problems, is to have disaggregated storage. So we, we take the storage from our compute nodes and put them in a separate tier. And what this allows us to do is allows us to have much faster auto-scaling. So now application A becomes popular, it takes us about 30 seconds to scale up. So very, very quickly, you know, 30 seconds your users will suffer, but very quickly you will get a bigger machine um, from AWS, and then you, you'll be able to um, handle that, that load spike. Uh, but not only that, now you have these different components that are both auto-scaling. That means you can also scale them down to save on, on money if you're not using them or, or, or have lower load. You can very easily get a new, let's say you're running some report and you don't want to um, you know, get the applications overloaded. You can create your own virtual instance, run your report, big job, whatever, and then bring it back down very easily because there's no storage that needs to be moved. And then on the storage side, we can size the storage tier based on the storage we need. And that means we can get, achieve very high storage utilization as well. So this is the final picture of our design. And this is um, what we kind of consider running as cloud native uh, system, where you have components that are each sized based on um, the, their bottlenecks. So query and ingest workers, they're sized based on their compute needs. They're auto-scaled, elastic. And then you have a storage tier that is sized and auto-scaled based on the storage needs. And this is, this is what we, we built uh, at Rockset. And now just a little bit of a side note is the question is what technology do we want to use for this aggregated storage? And usually most cloud providers give you like two types of options. One is the object store. In AWS case, that's S3. Another one is some sort of hot storage, uh, which is backed by SSD devices, by flash devices. It could be either EBS or NVMe. So the, the benefit of um, cold storage is that the cost of gigabyte is extremely cheap. And you also get very high durability. So when you write something to S3, it's mostly durable. Uh, you, can, you can depend on it. It's also very easy to get started with S3, because they just have SDK and has a built-in API that you can use to to do your IOs on, um, on S3, so you can very, very quick to get started. A very big downside, though, is, is it has a high latency for reads. Um, so in our case, you know, I talked about our latency budget for the, for the applications. It's about usually in hundreds of milliseconds. That is how long one IO to AWS S3 takes. It's hundreds of milliseconds. So you cannot go to S3 even once if you want your query to return um, at low latency that we require. And then if you actually do the math, it, the, the dollar cost per I.O. looks very small, but the number of I.O. you have to do, it turns out to be extremely expensive if you're doing a lot of I.O.s. So each I.O. in S3 could be big, but if you're doing small ones, um, it actually adds up quickly, and, and, and that becomes your dominating cost in your, in your, uh, in your cloud provider build. 
On the right-hand side, uh, the NVMe or EBS devices, they are very cheap in terms of I.O. NVMe devices have hundreds of thousands to million IOPS um, that they support. They're extremely low latency, you know, hundreds of microseconds or maybe less. Um, the downside is you have to um, build your own RPC service. It's a downside because you have to build something, but on the, on the, the benefit is you can craft it based on your needs, and usually that means you can build it more efficiently than you would if you have a generic service, and then you can pass those cost savings to your customers. So in our case, we build our own RPC service. Um, and then the big downside is actually quite expensive in terms of storage cost. So dollar per gigabyte is quite expensive if you store all of your data into on the flash devices. So today, Rockset runs mostly on the right-hand side of the spectrum, but you can imagine in the future we are trying to also kind of blend those two intelligently so that if you know you don't have to do a lot of IOPS, um, you can store some part of your data set into the cold storage and the hot part in the hot storage. But today we are mo almost all uh, purely in the hot storage space because we have uh, to support a lot of IOS. So finally, we, you know, Rockset is a cloud native search analytics database. Um, the design aspects are that we have three technologies that are main technology drivers for our design. Uh, first, we have doc sharding with indexes. We call this technology converged indexing. That gives us scalability. Um, because we have sharding, and it also gives us uh, very efficient streaming ingest with low latency. Uh, we do post-ingest replication, so we call this compute-compute separation, and I'll talk about that more in, um, soon. Uh, that gives us isolation between queries and ingest, um, and it also gives us compute elasticity. We can easily scale um, our virtual instances up and down. And then finally, we have this aggregated hot storage, which gives us compute storage separation. So this gives us, again, compute elasticity, because to get out of scaling, you don't have to move storage around. Um, it gives us high disk utilization, because we can size our, our hot storage tier based on the storage size, not based on compute. And it gives us storage elasticity, so we can scale up and down uh, based on our storage needs. So the next topic um, that, I'll, that I want to talk about is RocksDB replication. So this is the underpinning of our isolation between um, query and ingest compute. So in, in Rockset world, one Rockset shard is one RocksDB instance. We have many, many RocksDB sh Rockset shards and RocksDB instances within a single process. RocksDB is ma mainly fairly lightweight, so we can do that. Um, and the thing to understand of how RocksDB works, but thankfully I think a lot of you already know what RocksDB is, is that recent writes come into memtable, and then when memtable, which is in-memory write buffer, when the memtable is full, it's flushed to disk. And then after the file is flushed to disk, uh, it's immutable. It never changes. The only thing that can happen to the file is it can be deleted as part of the compaction process. And then there's also, you know, once a lot of files accumulate on disk, then there's a compaction process that takes some of them and, and kind of compacts them together and produces new files. <clears throat> the next thing to understand before we go to, into how we actually solve this is that um, how the document that comes into Rockset is mapped onto RocksDB keys. At the end of the day, everything is stored in RocksDB, but it's not like we just store the document in there. We insert it into many different layouts in, the, in RocksDB, which correspond to our indexes. So we have a search index, so we, that means that our document is, is stored in, in some search index RocksDB keys. We have a columnar index, uh, so we call this here scan optimized, so something where we store columns together. And then finally, we have a document store, where we just store a mapping between a primary key of a document to the document itself. But the main point to take away from this slide is that the complex, the, 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 the mapping within the document, the JSON document, and the RocksDB keys is extremely complex and hard to calculate. So now that we understand that, we can think of our ingest process in Rockset as a process that takes a logical update, that's a document that we want to insert, and turns that document into a series of physical deltas. And by physical deltas, here I mean uh, RocksDB key value pairs. Right, so you take a document that's in JSON or, or a batch of documents, and at the end of that process, you have a set of RocksDB key value pairs that you want to insert into RocksDB. And then the second step of that process is inserting those keys and values into RocksDB. And RocksDB takes them into the mem table and then later on merges them into its LSM state lazily. Now, the key insight here is that this to turn the logical update into physical data is much more expensive 
than applying the physical delta to RocksDB mem table. So the way we isolate search and query compute here is by making sure that, sorry, search and ingest compute here, is by making sure that the ingest worker turns the logical updates into physical deltas, and the query worker doesn't do that. The query worker takes the physical deltas and applies the physical delta to mem table. So the only thing that the query worker needs to do is apply key value pairs onto the RocksDB uh, mem table. And that's sorted, that's, that's, that can be made very, very efficient. So now basically the, 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 whole, the whole secret sauce here is to have the ingest worker take this logical stream, compute physical deltas, apply those physical deltas to its own mem table, and also send the physical deltas to the replication stream to the query worker. And then the query worker takes the physical deltas and applies them to the, to the mem table. And then we, our, our calculation gives us about order of magnitude is the difference in cost between calculating the physical deltas and applying them to the Roxy mem table. The second benefit we do get is I talked about this process called flush. Flush is a process where you take the mem table and, 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 and convert the mem table into SSD file on disk. And then the second uh, process is a compaction, which takes a couple of files as an input and produces a couple of files as an output, which kind of like merge them together and, and, and make them, let's say, more compressed or so on. That process only happens on the ingest worker. Once that process happens, your, the, the ingest worker sends a notification, hey, I did compaction through the replication stream, and then what the query worker does, it just applies that to its metadata state. So you, you can imagine having a, a metadata update saying, I compacted file five, file five is now file seven, and that's the only thing that the, that the query worker gets in the, in the stream. And applying that is super cheap, of course. And so what, what is in the replication stream record? Um, so replication stream record could be write batch. Write batch is in RocksDB term for this physical delta. Uh, so it's literally just a list of key value updates, and there's a type in there. Are you deleting the key? Are you merging the key? Or are you inserting the key? And then you have a mem table switch, which is a record which happens when the mem table is full. You kind of seal it, and that means you make sure that the mem table contents are the same from between the ingest worker and the query worker. So you have a mem table switch that you send through the replication stream, and then you have a so-called manifest update. And so the manifest update, you send that record when you when you flush, then the record means drop the current mem table and add a file atomically. And then a compaction will just tell you delete some files and add some files. And those files are already part of the hot storage. So literally the only thing that query worker has to do is it, ne it knows about new files and it can already start reading them from the hot storage at very low latency. So that's it on the Roxy replication. Are there any questions at this point about this? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned an ingestion worker. Um, you mentioned an ingestion worker and a query worker. Um, is this part of RocksDB architecture, or is this changes that you made to, to RocksDB? I don't know it, uh, like its internals, but I know it sort of works as a black box, so you shouldn't be able to do these changes. So I'm wondering if I misunderstood something. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So query worker and ingest worker are rock set terminology. Um, the the support for replication stream was added to the RocksDB cloud, which is a library that we open sourced. Um, but there's a lot of components that are not open sourced, unfortunately. So replication infrastructure is not open source, um, some, other, some other parts. But the, 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 main, the main kind of part that does apply those records into RocksDB are part of the RocksDB cloud. It's, they're not part of the upstream RocksDB yet. I, I, I want to make that happen at some point, but I need to go talk to ROCKSDB team. And when you say query worker, you mean the worker that actually takes queries uh, from the application and handles them? Correct. Correct. So it reads the current state from storage or something and applies the stream of updates that they get that we haven't applied yet? It continuously applies the stream of updates so that to maintain that ingest latency less than one second. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions so far? Can I ask a quick one? Yeah, go ahead. The microphone. So, um, at a time you mentioned um, doc sharding, and you mentioned queries go to all the shards. Correct. Um, did you consider uh, using hashes so that you know consistently where a given document is going to be? Uh, are you aware of that technique? So, if it's a query that has a predicate on the primary key, then um, we, yeah. we can do that. Yeah. Right. 
Okay. We but don't do yet today. We don't do that today, okay. but we could. Yeah, <laughs> we don't have many queries that have a that have a primary key per predicate usually, but we could do that. That we kind of selectively prune the shards we go to. Yeah. We just didn't build that yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So the next topic and also a very important part of this puzzle of how we actually separate out ingest and query is shared hot storage. Because as I mentioned, the thing that flows through the replication stream is pointers to files in hot storage. So we go back to RocksDB, and now we are looking at the RocksDB process from the angle of what is its IO pattern. Okay? So writes are buffered in the mem table. Mem table, when it's, once it's full, it's flushed to disk. When it's flushed to disk, it's flushed many megabytes at once. In our case, I think it's 64 megabytes at once. That file is then immutable, never changes. Um, then the compaction takes a couple of files and again writes out files in one go, 64 megabytes at once. So as you can see that our writes are big. We don't have any small writes in our system. And the second thing to understand is that our writes, we don't actually care too much about their latency. Because if you flush is slightly delayed, it's fine. You just use a little bit more memory. If the compaction is slightly delayed, it's also OK. Right? You, can, you, can take, you can take the hit. It's, not, it's also not the most expensive part of the compaction. The IO is not the most expensive part of the compaction. So we can take a hit on the IO latency. Okay, so on, on writes, we don't care about small writes. And we do not care about fast writes at all. What about reads? So on reads, we have different patterns based on the query. That's where story gets more complicated. So we have a query fragment that's part of the query where you can decide which index to use. You can use a columnar index, you can use a search index, or you can use a vector index, right? Uh, on the column scan side, I think it's fairly straightforward. You just scan, and there you're usually bandwidth limited. You don't have to do a lot of small IOs. Um, but the hard part is actually when you do a search query. When you do a search query, you do index lookup. That's a lot of random reads, but what's even more random reads is index lookup gives you a document set of document IDs. So then I need to go to the document store to actually get the actual documents from there, based on those document IDs that the, that the posting list in the written index gives you. That's even more IOs that you have to, that you have to process. And all of these are very small. So our read patterns are, we have very small reads um, that are latency limited, and we are also IOPS limited. And of course, we also doc shards, so we are even more IOPS limited in this case. So the, the core insight here is that we have big writes. They should go to S3. And we also don't care about their latency, so we can take a hit of the S3 write latency completely, even if it's much bigger than it is today. But small reads cannot go to S3. That would bankrupt all of us. So small reads need to go to SSD. So how we do this is by having the, the ingest worker when it produces a file as part of the flush or compaction process, it produces that file in the cloud storage in S3. And then it pings the hot storage layer saying, I have a file for you. Can you please download it? And we call this operation prefetch. Before prefetch is done, it's not the file is not considered committed. So we take additional latency hit for our, our writes. We, we don't care about write latency, if you remember that. So we can take this additional hit to wait for the shared hot storage, which has SSD technology, to download the file from S3. And after the file is downloaded, then we can mark the file um, as committed. So that happens. And then after the file is committed, we can put it in our application stream and let our query worker know, hey, there's a file for you there. And the query worker, immediately when it gets a notification about the new file, that file will already be present in the hot storage. So it never reads from S3. Because as soon as you read from S3, your query latency budget is gone. You're already, you're already west, way past your, your timeout. So what we get with S3, we get durability. We get high bandwidth for, read, for writes. And then our reads go to one, one copy SSD, um, which is part of our, our shared hot storage tier, which gives us low latency, high IOPS, all the good things, and very efficient and cheap small reads. And it also gives us high space utilization because we have a separate tier that we size based on the storage needs because we don't care about the compute on those nodes. Now, the challenge is, if you think about it, what is a shared hot storage tier is essentially cache over S3. That's all it is. But it's a peculiar kind of cache where if you miss in the cache, your cache miss is 1,000 times slower. So 
S3 latency is about you know hundreds of milliseconds, and flash latency is about hundreds of um, of microseconds. So that's three orders of magnitude slower. So we need to make, make very very sure that we never cache miss. As soon as you cache miss, you go to S3, you're 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 done. So the way we do that, we enumerated all the reasons why there could be a cache miss, and just go went and fixed all of them. So the first challenge of cache miss is cold miss. Cold miss happens when you go to ask for a file to your cache, and the, file, the cache just said, I never heard of this file before. Just, you know, I don't know about this file. So the way to fix that, and we talked about this uh, in the previous slide, is our replication leader file commit protocol doesn't consider file committed until it was downloaded on the, on the, uh, on the hot storage tier. And then we also have this kind of catch-all periodic S3 listing where we try to find any files that we potentially missed. Um, just kind of as a second second order, um, kind of to save us a little bit if, if if somehow prefetch failed, which it usually doesn't. Second problem is a capacity miss, where you might just not have enough um, machines that you need in our in your in your storage tier. And the way we solve that, we have an auto scaling controller we built in Kubernetes that keep, that keeps a buffer, and then when our storage free storage goes below that buffer, we get new new nodes from AWS and and, and size up the cluster. But the cool part is our buffer can actually be quite tight because we know ahead of time that we have storage needs. So we have this process called bulk load. When the customer comes and says, I want 100 terabytes ingested, that process usually takes about one hour. And during that one hour, we don't actually store that data in hot storage. So one hour before, we know we, we will need 100 terabytes in an hour. And then we can already kind of talk to our auto-scaling tier and say, hey, can you start sizing up the hot storage tier? So that means we can actually operate with a very tight buffer, which makes our system much more efficient. Um, I don't know if how much you work with Kubernetes, but Kubernetes likes doing these things where you do a software update, where it uh, kills the process before kill it, getting the new one. So we don't like that, because if you kill the process and the process holds some files there, you, you're going to have a cache miss. So we built this thing called zero downtime deploy, where temporarily you bring two processes up, um, they communicate through POSIX. All the files, all the cache are in, are in the file system, so they can, they can agree on the current state. Um, and then when the new process has been running uh, and, and pre-warmed, then we, only then we kill the old process. So that um, solves our cache miss during upgrade. Uh, cluster resizing is fun. So what happens when cluster resizing? You add a new node, and then immediately when you add a new node, there's somebody who does some calculation, decides, my file lives on that node, even though that node is not yet fully pre-warmed. So what we do, we, call, we use rendezvous hashing to, to map files to nodes. And rendezvous hashing has this nice property of telling you if this is the current primary, it can also tell you which primary was there before. So in our case, we have server three, which is the current primary for our file. And then when you add a new server, even though a server is called, we still have the access to the information that server three was the pre previous primary. And so we have this kind of second chance go to the previous primary and see if the file is still there, and we just make sure that the primary, the old primary keeps the file around for a little bit before the new, new, new machine can, can warm up and download its state. Uh, failure recovery is also something that, that, that is not nice, that, that we need to fix. Recovering one AWS i3e node takes 48 minutes, so that's the node we use for uh, our hot storage tier. Um, that's mostly because of disk bandwidth. It has you know, terabytes of data and um, you need to fill, fill that all up. Um, and then obviously with rendezvous hashing, when your node fails, all other nodes in the cluster take some part of the recovery work. So if you have 100 machines in your tier, recovering takes only 28 seconds for all of them to download their, their, their portion of the data set. We, in addition, we have an LRU list to prioritize recovery. So we keep um, some uh, frequently accessed files uh, in the LRU list, and, and we recover them first. Uh, so that way, we, we use cache misses even more. The res end result of all that is our hot storage is almost perfect S3 cache. So it's been, this, this has been true from when we built, wrote those slides. It was six days since the last cache miss. This happens so rarely, we have it hooked to an alarm. And when it, you know, when it fires, we go in and investigate. And then you know, we have many nines, if you want to count, of cache hit rate going into, into our hot storage. So finally, we talked about query and just compute separation, which uh, is underpinned by two technologies. One is RocksDB replication, uh, where, we, where we do the work of um, logical to physical in one machine, and then the other machines just apply the physical updates. 
We talk about shared hot storage, which helps us um, reduce the storage costs. And all of this gives us this nice product where we can independently scale ingest query and storage based on each other needs. So something that we call cloud native. That's, that's my talk. I'm happy to take questions. Go ahead. You mentioned you have mem table to mem table rem replication. Do you have a problem of duplicate writes because of that? Because mem table would be flushing to the storage, common storage layer as well, right? So when the mem table flushed, so there, mem table goes through two, two um, states before flushing. So first state is it is actively being written to. And then this mem table switch that I briefly talked about makes the mem table immutable and adds a new mem table that's now being written to. So you have temporarily you have two mem tables. And only the immutable mem table, which, which now is kind of sealed, is being flushed to storage. And this mem table, the important part is this mem table switch operation, which seals the mem table, goes to the replication stream as well. So when the flush happens, the, the follower, the, the query worker, knows which mem table to kill and replace with the file. But so we don't have that problem because we never flush the mem table that's being written to actively. Got it, thank you. And one other aspect of this is like you've moved CPU bound to uh, network bound, I guess. Uh, do you have a problem of network being slower um, and essentially having instance caching, uh, so which I, I didn't get from the slides? So we, we, so the only thing that we were worried about on the networking side is the recovery of i3EN machines because when you either recovery or scaling up, because you have many terabytes of data that you have to download from S3. But it turns out network is not actually the bottleneck there. The disk bandwidth is. So I think that this bandwidth gives you 48 minutes to recover, and I think network would give you like, a, um, like half an hour to recover. So in, in the end, like it's, it's actually the, the bottleneck is on the disk, not on the network. And we don't, like, we don't see very often other parts of our system being bottlenecked by the network, especially like AWS new machines have very nice NICs, so they give us a lot of bandwidth there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so if I understand correctly, so you said that the SSD, the gigabytes are, are, are expensive, but and from the slide, and, and but you're still writing, let's say, from S3 to SSD. So do you write all the data? And so what's the purpose of the S3 at all? Sorry, what, what's the purpose of S3? Yes, while you write everything at, at the end to the SSD. Uh, what's the purpose of S3 or what's the purpose of SSD? Uh, what's the purpose of S3? S3. S3, we need to write to S3 because of durability. Otherwise, if you write only to SSD, um, there's not that you know, either, neither EBS is very, I mean, EBS has high durability, but only within one AZ, and, and, and it's also very hard to move one EBS from one node to another, so we rely on S3 for, for much higher durability aspects. Um, and it's, the cost of S3 is not actually very high for us. The, the, we pay much higher cost for our SSDs. But we have to use SSD because we need to have, we have to access a lot of small reads, and if if you didn't have SSD, obviously things will be slower, but also it'd be very very expensive to 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 satisfy all of those small reads with S3, given their pricing that is fairly high per I/O. Clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll be hanging around after if you wanna if you have any other questions or want to check out Rockset. Thank you.